Hi, everybody. I know I was um, introduced as the Global Equality and Leadership Manager at IKEA. And typically, when I speak in front of audiences, I talk about IKEA or IKEA and our approach for diversity and inclusion. But today, I was actually asked to talk about my personal journey. So it's a little bit of a different experience for me. Um, I wanted to say, actually, thank you for the fantastic inspiration in the morning with all of the differences of the women, the strong women, the successful women, who sat here and shared our, their journey with us. Thank you for that. I think you set the stage in a really good way. So when I was asked to talk about my personal journey, I realized typically I just continue going with life. I do something, I fall, I get up, and I continue. I don't actually take too much time to reflect on what brought me to here, what did it take for me to do. So it was a really good opportunity for, to do that. What I do know is that I have this burning need to contribute to making this world more fair. And to make all people, whoever they are, whatever their background, to feel that they are equal and worthy. That is a burning sensation that took me throughout my life and my career. So my personal story. I grew up in a family of eight children. My parents immigrated to Israel from Iraq. And as Iraqi Jews, they maintain a very traditional household. The women, they're supposed to be in the kitchen. They are supposed to take care of the children and of the house chores. And the men, they are the breadwinner. So already in childhood, I was fighting for fairness and equality not accepting the, the role of this typical girl with all of the stereotypes that were associated with it. You see, among the eight kids that we were, we are seven girls and one boy. <laughs> so my parents lear learned very fast that we were not just stubborn. We were independent girls with big dreams. And we will not continue the tradition that our parents brought with them. In an early age, I was identified, actually, as a gifted child, and I was placed in an after-school program to make sure that I'm using my potential. But then came middle school. In Israel, we had an integration in middle school, so already in seventh grade, they were busing children from less fortunate neighborhoods to a more wealthy neighborhood. This was the first time when I actually encountered diversity and biases and stereotypes. The assumption that your socioeconomic background is actually an indicator to your intelligence and to your capabilities. So before the formal tests results for placement arrived, they decided to put all the kids from my school in the lowest level of classes. I remember the first English class in the seventh grade. The curriculum was based on the assumption that those kids know nothing. I was insulted, I was mad, I was sad, I was full of emotions. At that time, I was already reading fluently English books. I'm not going to stay in the class that teaches us the ABC. So I marched out to the vice, president, vice, vice principal office, and I demanded to speak with her. After argument, they realized this girl is not moving. So they let me see her. She agreed, she asked me to agree to stay another month until the test results arrived. I was not letting go. I'm not going to do that, I said. Just because I came from this neighborhood, you will not determine my future. I will not go 
to this class again. So she gave me a test on the spot. And after I passed the test, she moved me to the most advanced class. But I was the only kid that was moved. Other kids from my neighborhood were not moved. They had to wait until the test results arrived. I felt it's not fair, but I couldn't do anything about it. My journey continued. I was in the army. In, the is in Israel, you know, all women and men serve in the army. It's mandatory. But in the army, I was sent to officer's training. And after officer's training, I was placed in a... Sorry. Uh, after officer pl uh, training, I was asked to serve in the paratrooper division. And I was placed as the first woman human resource officer in the paratrooper division. Once again, I was faced with all of those stereotypes of being a woman among men. So what did I do? I decided I'm not going to fight this time. So I, I asked for main unifor male uniform. I dressed like a man, I spoke like a man, and I looked like a man. I worked twice as hard as the men just to be recognized equally to them. It's hard work. I don't think it's necessary. Then, when I went to university, it's not coincidence that I decided to focus on organizational psychology and on people's behavior in organization. So I studied stereotypes and biases and cultural differences. But when I came to the United States with my master's degree and with years of experience, there was another bias against me. I had an accent. You know, my perception of accent is if you have accent, that means that you know more languages. Maybe you're quite intelligent. <laughs> but it's not the case in many places because accent is associated with less intelligence. So I was not able to get any job in my field. Once again, how do I fight? I went back to school. I went to complete my doctorate degree, focusing on organizational psychology. And in one of the jobs, I was working in a consulting firm, and IKEA was hiring this consulting firm. They wanted support with cultural diversity. So they had asked me to help. I created the entire strategy, all the tools, everything that went with it. But when time came, for me to work with IKEA, my manager said, hold on, you will prepare the things behind the scene. I'm going to contact my colleague, Rick, who is a man, because I believe they can relate better to a man. So here I am thinking about the irony behind it. They want to talk about diversity, but they will ask a man to work with them. It took a few months. And then I finally decided I am done preparing the material behind the scene. I would like to meet with this team and ask them what's wrong with working with a woman. And at that point, I met with IKEA management team and I realized it was not their stereotype. It was my manager's stereotype because she assumed that men would rather work with men. So what did I do? I quit her consulting firm and I joined IKEA. I chose to work for a company that shares my values, a company with humanistic values that actually want to work with cultural diversity, that actually wants to make an impact on society. But you know, what I invite you to do today, also after listening to the panelists today, even if you make an impact in your own life, society is not always behind you. Society will fight against you. I am also one of those women who is married an egalitarian, with an egalitarian relationship, and my husband stayed home with my son so that I can travel. But you know what they called him? It's probably here as well. They called him Mr. Mom. And that was an insult, actually. It wasn't a compliment. 
It's not a possibility that a man stays home because he wants to take care of his children. And even though he was highly involved in the school with my son, my son kept getting those notes from the teacher. Give this to your mom. Why are you not involved in school? When I wrote back, well, my husband is involved, it wasn't good enough for her. She felt that the mother has a different role, and the mother needs to be volunteering in school. So here we are in a modern society in the United States, fighting against those very basic stereotypes. So even when you're trying to further your career, you're trying to change the way that you work and that you live your life, people all around you are putting all of those walls and boundaries and are telling you, hold on, we don't want you to change society. So as a woman, you are fighting a really strong fight. On the one hand, you need to be this extremely competent, or else they will ask, how did you get the job? Is it not by qualification? <coughs> and once you do that, it's not enough, because society then criticizes you. You're not a good enough wife. You're not a good enough mother. You're not caring enough. How can we mean in this society? My invitation today is for all of you, for all of us, to get together, to create a movement. We have started creating this movement in IKEA. I am working with 78 ambassadors from all over the IKEA world. They are representing all the countries with different cultures, with different limitations. And what we do together, we created this movement. We are going to push society wherever we are, we are going to change the perception in society. Being egalitarian is a good thing. It's a good thing for the individual, it's a good thing for the family, it's a good thing for businesses, and it's definitely a good thing for society. We don't have to work that hard just to prove it. So I'm extending the invitation here today. How about if we all take this role in society? Let us women not criticize other women. This has been my learning. <laughs> Let's not have women all over the world say, I was lucky because a man mentored me, because the other women stood in my way. I think it's a choice that we make. Let's make a choice to mentor each other, to support each other, and to sympathize with each other, rather than putting all of those blocks, don't change on us societal roles. I heard somebody say before, maybe it's in our DNA. Of course it is not in our DNA to be more caring. It's a choice that we make. You have all heard, probably, the World Economic Forum. It will take us another 170 years to bridge the gap and 217 years to bridge the pay gap. Well, here's a challenge for us together here, extremely strong professional women. Let's prove them wrong. Thank you. Did you want to do the Q&A?